chapter 18 of Revelation with the fall of Babylon the Great. Two chapters, in fact, even a little bit of this one was dedicated to Babylon. It was the city of evil. It was this place of, of immense evil. It was an originator of idolatry. This is where idolatry originated from. Almost every major cult uh, can be traced back its roots to this city of Babylon. It's where the Tower of Babel uh, was once raised in this first uh, effort of man to come together and to create their own way to heaven, to cast off rule, to cast off restraint from God, and to, and to seek this heaven on their own. And uh, God, of course, thwarted that and uh, caused the, the nations to be divided by languages. And so they spread out, and, and he caused them to go into all the world, which they were supposed to do. They were supposed to fill the world, and they, they decided to create cities and, and come together in that. So this, this city of Babylon has had a, a profound impact. It had been destroyed in history past, but not completely destroyed like the Bible has prophesied would happen. And so this city... We are expecting to be rebuilt, and, and not, it, not that it's not a city now, it is, but uh, to be restored into this great power and this great uh, earthly power. But uh, this city has ceased to exist here in chapter 18. It will be totally destroyed. And so it's, uh, it brings us to this chapter 19 with the four hallelujahs, and, uh, which means praise Yahweh. And it appears only four times in the New Testament, and that's right here in the book of Revelation. This is uh, uniquely interesting because it is a Hebrew word that is in the midst of a Greek text. So everything else is written in Greek, but this word is written in Hebrew. And so it's, it's interesting that, that it is mentioned here, and uh, it's, a, it's an amazing thing. The book of Revelation has 404 verses. And within it are 800 Old Testament references. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing, too, because it's a book. If with that many Old Testament references, who do you think it's pointing to? Who is it? But who is it, who is it, who is it directed to, this book? With 800 Hebrew verses, Old Testament verses. These are verses that are meant to gain the attention of the Jewish people. This book is largely aimed at that because the church is only dealt with in the first three, isn't it? And we're out of here. So the rest of this is directed, aimed, and intended for Jewish people to come to faith during the time of tribulation. During this time of tribulation, you're going to see that this is meant to bring the Jewish people back to faithfulness. The book of Hosea describes this relationship with God and the Jewish people, isn't it? This unfaithful wife, this harlot who sells herself and, and now is coming back to faith. And, and so this whole book just seems to be pulling at the Hebrew people to say, come back, repent, come back to me. And will God accept his bride again? Or accept the, the Israelites back? Yes, he will. He's, uh, he's got this intended for them. And so there's a there's a a really strong Hebrew uh, kind of a flavor, so to speak, to the book of Revelation. It's, it's really important that we, that we know and understand that. Now, the, the church, of course, is not here and around during this time because we are in heaven. We have been taken up. We've been gathered together with them in what we term the rapture. And so we are out of here. We are in heaven watching all this take place. And so this fall of Babylon, if you go back to 18... Starting in the 20th verse, it says, Rejoice over her, you heavens. Rejoice, you people of God. Rejoice, apostles and prophets. For God has judged her with the judgment she imposed on you. Notice it says, who, who is rejoicing? The apostles and the prophets. For God has judged her. The judgment he, that he imposed is complete. It's, it's happened. She has been destroyed. And then it says in 19 verse 1, it says, After this, after this judgment has been imposed on Babylon, after this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting. Have you ever been to a football game when, the, the, when 
when the underdog is down and all of a sudden something turns around and boom, they're back on top and they win. The, I mean, it's just like the roar and the eruption of the crowd is just like, wow. it's just immense and huge. And you could just imagine what it's going to be like in heaven with far more than what's in a stadium. I mean, millions and millions of people up there just shouting. And then you hear this hallelujah, this praise Yahweh. It's just this huge roar of a multitude shouting hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute. Who is the great prostitute? That city of Babylon. Could be the physical city, could be this, uh, this, the papacy in Rome, could be a, a multitude of different things. But this, thing, this, this great prostitution, this great prostitute has been condemned and destroyed, this, this, this wickedness that has been just infecting the world is destroyed. It says, who corrupted the earth by her adulteries. He has avenged on her the blood of his servants. And they shouted again, or again they shouted, it says, hallelujah. So again, this huge uproar of hallelujah. The smoke from her, her goes up forever and ever. This is an incredible thing. You've had fires before, and as soon as the wood is done, the smoke goes out, doesn't it? It stops, stops burning. There's nothing more to burn. But this smoke will go forever and ever. It'll be an eternal smoke coming up from, from this as a reminder. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who was seated on the throne. And they cried, Amen, hallelujah. Crying again, these 24 elders. This is the first time we've seen them in a while. And the four living creatures around them, they worshiped God, shouting hallelujah. Then a voice from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting hallelujah. So it's getting even louder and you can see this intensity growing and, and just getting excited and, and so thankful to God for what he has done. Hallelujah for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Lord God Almighty reigns. He rules and he reigns. If you would, turn to Psalm 110. Psalm 110. We'll be doing a little bit of flipping back and forth, uh, so just be prepared to, to kind of move around. And in Psalm chapter 110, this is a verse that you'll probably be familiar with because Jesus used this verse, and he used it against the Pharisees uh, to, to declare his, his lordship and his godship. Uh, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Sit at my right hand. So the Lord is saying, to Jesus, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. So where is Jesus' throne? Where is he sitting now? He is sitting at the right hand of God Almighty. What is the right hand? It's that place of power. It's that place of authority. And Jesus is sitting there. And he's going to sit there until what? Until God makes his enemies his footstool. This is the fulfillment of the footstool. This is that fulfillment of God making his enemies, his footstool. Then what is Jesus going to do? He's going to sit there a little longer? No. He's going to come, isn't he? He's going to be getting on his horse and getting ready to ride, isn't he? So this is an exciting time. This is a fulfillment of prophecy. This is a fulfillment of all these things that are going to come. It's an amazing, amazing time. If you would, turn to Matthew 22. And in Matthew 22, we'll start in the 40, 41st, 40, uh, 
Yeah, let's start in 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, called him Lord? For he says, Lord, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any questions. How could David call him Lord? The only way he could is if he were God. It's amazing. David recognized. David, a Jew, recognized the Lord. He recognized Jesus. Who else did? Abraham. Jesus declared that Abraham knew. Abraham understood that he was God. The Jews, for in large, rejected it and did not acknowledge it. But Jesus points it out. There are two different thrones mentioned that Jesus will rule with. One will be the throne in heaven sitting beside God Almighty, but he would also rule on David's throne, won't he? But David's throne has yet to come. David's throne was a what throne? It's an earthly throne, wasn't it? He ruled where? He was king of Israel, ruled in Jerusalem. And so we're going to see in Scripture here that Jesus will come and will rule on David's throne also. How long will he rule for? The millennial. He will rule for 1,000 years, and the government will be upon his shoulders, the Word of God says. And he will rule for 1,000 years here on earth. And you're going to see him come down off of the throne in heaven. He will come down. He will take authority on the earth, and he will rule and reign here for 1,000 years. Isn't that amazing? And you're going to see government run like it should. Won't that be an awesome time to be here? Can you imagine being able to trust your government that when Jesus says something, he's going to do it, he's going to fulfill it, and there's no evil behind what he's saying he's going to do? Oh, what a joy that would be. Earth operating, functioning the way it should. Nations dealing with each other rightly. Oh, it would be phenomenal. It's going to be an amazing time to be on earth. But we'll get there in just a little bit. So if you would, turn back to Revelation, chapter, er, chapter 19, verse 7. It says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding supper of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Who is the bride? The church, right? We're ready. We're there. We're up there. So this wedding supper of the Lamb, there's two suppers met, mentioned here in 19. There's going to be two of them. One is an amazing, great supper that you want to be invited to. The third one, not so much. I mean, the second one, not so much. The second one is a disgusting, nasty supper that you're not going to want to eat. Uh, you won't want to be a part of. But for this first one, it's going to be an amazing supper, this, this wedding supper of the Lamb. And it says, The bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for righteous acts of God's holy people. Now remember in Scripture that the high priest was not allowed to marry anyone but a virgin. That was a requirement. And remember, Jesus fulfilled the law, didn't he? And as our high priest, he had to marry a virgin bride. Well, guess what? That would mean that the church would not be acceptable, right? Because we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we are not a virgin bride, so to speak, are we? But our righteousness is coming from an imputed righteousness. It's a given righteousness from Jesus and Jesus alone. It is by grace that we have been saved. We have been forgiven and washed away. Our sin has been washed away and, and cleansed. We have imputed righteousness. That means we have been given his righteousness. It's not one of our own. It's not one of works, lest any man should boast. There's nothing you can do to earn it. 
No matter what your conscience tells you, no matter what the enemy whispers in your ear, you're not good enough, you need to do more, you need to do better, you need to do this and you need to do that. It's not about doing, it is about what? Receiving. It is totally gifted and given. Nothing I can do can earn it. Then why do you do? Because faith without works is dead. When you believe in God, what do you want to do? Bless him. You want to do something for him. You want to say thank you. And so our works are not to earn. Our works are to say thank you. Because if any man says he loves me but doesn't obey me, he is a liar and the truth is not in him. So we obey God and we do the things he asks us to do, not to earn, but simply to say, I love you. Thank you. It's a demonstration of our love. It's putting deeds to our words. And Jesus did that. Israel is portrayed in Scripture as a wife of Yahweh in Isaiah 54. Also portrayed as a harlot in Ezekiel 16.35. Hosea talks of this. The whole story of Isaiah was meant to be a demonstration, a visual aid, so to speak, in case they couldn't get it, in case they couldn't understand it. You had a visual aid to help you understand and know what was going on. And God spoke to them and said, look, you are an adulterous wife. You are unfaithful to me. I have been good to you. I have loved you. I have purchased you. And you have been unfaithful to me. So Israel is portrayed as this person. Has the church also been that? Yes. We are not any better than Israel was. Okay? I... I remember as a, a young man going to Bible college, I was frustrated with my, my professors because one of them said that if you want to have a, a church that grows, you need to limit your minorities. I, I just couldn't believe it came out of his mouth. I st- stood there kind of aghast going, how does Jesus come to my church then? Because Jesus was not a white man. He was from the Middle East. You know, how does Jesus come? You know, what, what are you saying here? You know, it's like it, his, his, his words were just incredible. And I was just like, and then seeing the religiosity, seeing the fakeness and the embracing of the fakeness. I was just like, I, I just wanted to get out of America. I was so sick. I was like, I don't want to be here anymore. I want to go out into the world and I want to, I want to go somewhere where this isn't. Well, God eventually led me to Indonesia. And while in Indonesia, I went to a, a, a church service, this uh, uh, Chinese Christian businessman or whatever, he was excited about this thing, and he invited me to this event, and I had no idea what it was. He just said, oh, there's this event going on, and I want, you, I want to pick you up and take you. So he picked me up and took me there, and, and we get there, and it's already started, and we get our seats or whatever, and this lady's up there on the, on the platform. She's just yelling and screaming, and, and, and it's all in Indonesia. So I didn't understand a word of it, but I could tell she was preaching, you know, because she was just yelling and screaming and stomping and carrying on and running back and forth and all this stuff. And then she got done, and they held up scorecards. I, 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 again, stunned. The same stunned feeling I felt when I, I and, and I just began to weep. And I was like, God, how did it get here? I'm in Indonesia. If any place in the world it should be real, it should be real right here. And it was fake. It was pumped up, and it was practiced, and it was polished, and it was all this, and it was like, God. And he spoke to me and said, Gary, it's the heart of man. It doesn't matter where you go. You could go to a little island. You could go to Africa. You could go anywhere you want to go. And man's going to be there. Why? Because we have a problem being real. Men love the darkness instead of the light because their deeds are evil. But how many of you have experienced bringing your evil deeds into the light and have them exposed and forgiven? There is nothing more glorious than that, to be washed and to be cleansed 
to have your garments washed white as snow, to be imputed with his righteousness is just an amazing feeling. The weight of sin just drops off of you. This is what the bride of Christ will have. This is how she can be presented as a virgin bride because all things have been made new. We are born again, born anew. We are a new creation. And this is how we are presented to the high priest in righteousness and fulfillment of even the law. It fulfills every dot and every tittle. It is amazing. So we are imputed with Christ's righteousness. It is powerful. I had a lot of other notes on that, but we're going to keep, keep on moving. So this wedding supper of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. That is a key portion of this verse. It was given her to wear. Was she deserving of it? No. But she was given it. Righteousness is imputed and given. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet and worshipped him. So who's he worshipping? An angel. He falls at the feet of this angel, John. He falls at the feet of this angel and worships this angel. The angel's like, thank you very much. No, he didn't. What does this angel say? Don't do that. It says, basically, stop. Whoa, uh-uh. Don't do this. Every angel mentioned in Scripture that is given worship falsely and wrongly, though maybe not intended with ill intent, but was given worship, always stopped them from worshiping them. But mentioned in Scripture is the angel of the Lord who had accepted worship. This is none other than a Christophany. It is an appearance of Jesus himself. And we can understand and know by that appearance and by that worship and the acceptance of the worship that it is Jesus himself who is appearing who accepted worship. But any other angel will refuse it and say, no, don't do this. He said, but he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. So this, this angel quickly turned it around and sent it back to God, didn't he? Now, are there angels that would accept worship? Not any that are righteous. But Satan himself, what did he want? He wanted worship, didn't he? He wanted to ascend his throne equal to that of God's. He wanted to be worshipped. And what happened to him? He was cast out of heaven along with a third of the angels of heaven. So there would possibly be angels that would accept worship, but they would not be angels that are holy. They would be angels that are unholy. They would be demons or they would be Satan himself. And so those are the only ones that would want to receive that type of worship. Any godly angel would not accept it. And so they would always point you to Jesus and always point you to God. In verse 11 it says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse. Heaven standing open is only mentioned one other time in the Bible, and that was at Jesus' baptism. Isn't that amazing? Heaven open. <laughs> And a voice from heaven came and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. It's amazing. And that's when the Holy Spirit had descended upon him like a, in the form of a dove. And everyone heard the voice. It was an amazing thing. But heaven opened. And out comes Jesus on a horse. He's off the throne. It's time to go. Jesus didn't know when this time would come, but he was waiting for it and sitting on the throne. His enemy has been made a footstool, and now he's on a white horse. For those of you who wonder, are there going to be animals in heaven? There will be horses at least. If my daughter has anything to do with it, there will be dogs also. 
and hamsters and fish. And <laughs> we've, we've laid many to rest. <laughs> but, but you know the heart of your God, don't you? Does God love the animals? Does he feed them? Does he take care of them? He absolutely does. He loves them. So are there animals in heaven? Well, there's at least horses, and there's some wild-looking creatures up there as well. But you know your God. You know him. Trust him. He's got it taken care of. So there before me was a white horse. Can you imagine this white horse? Just imagine this. And all of heaven opens up, and here's this great stallion, this great white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. Is there anyone faithful like Jesus? No. Is there anyone true like him? No. He is the way, the truth, and the life. With justice, it says, he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. This word for crowns, implies diadems. It's a lasting crown. Other crowns mentioned are the victor's crown. And, and you know, Paul mentions that. You, know, you run for the, for the prize. You run for this crown that's given to you. But it's a temporal crown, isn't it? It's one that fades. It's one made of leaves. It's not a, it's not a lasting crown. But this one is a lasting crown, meaning his lordship will be eternal. It'll last forever. Jesus foretold of this, this event happening in Matthew 26, 57. If you would, turn there. Jesus before, before the Sanhedrin, he says, those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where, he was te where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. But they did not find any though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I am, able, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. He had to respond to this declaration because it was the high priest commanding him to speak and he had to speak. Jesus replied, you have said so. Have said what? You are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus here declares that he is God. If you ever hear someone say, well, Jesus never said he was the, the Son of God, point them to this verse. Why would the Jews put him to death if he did not claim this? If this was not an accurate claim of him claiming his lordship, they would not have put him to death. This is powerful, and this is important. But I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, and coming on the clouds of heaven. He declared he was going to be sitting at the right hand of God. What is the right hand of God? It is the power position. It is the place of authority of God. And he is sitting there. But he is going to be coming on the clouds of heaven. Go back to Revelation 19. So in verse... 11, to reiterate, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. So here is this victor coming, and he's coming for war. 
He has a name written on him that no one knows but himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. And his name is the word of God. His robe dipped in blood. What is this blood? It's not his blood because he's not in need of forgiveness, is it? Some scholars think that this is the blood of his enemies. Could be. I would throw out there, perhaps it's the blood of the martyrs. Perhaps it's a reminder. A reminder of what he's going for. In my mind, that seems to make sense. You know how a warrior would carry the cloth of, a, of his wife or someone who had been killed as a reminder you know, to say, I'm never going to forget, I'm going to avenge, I'm going to bring this, because the Bible says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. It is his to take. And so could this be the blood of the martyrs? It, it could be. Could it be the blood of his enemies? It could be, because he's going to be trampling the wine press, and so obviously his robes could get in there. Don't know for certain. If you've got any information regarding that that could help point that out, you know, please let me know. But uh, just two options that, that are possible there. Does it really matter to me? No, I'm in heaven. <laughs> At this point, I'm in heaven, and, and I'm, on, I'm on a horse, and I'm riding with him. It don't matter to me. You know, it's like I'm following the winner here. I'm, I'm going to be following the leader here. It's a, it's a good thing. And so he's, he's got this, this robe. He's got the crown. And his name is the word of God. The word of God. Jesus was the word made flesh, wasn't he? He was the word in action. The word in action. When you saw Jesus, you saw the word of God. Because he embodied it. He lived it. How many of us fall short of it? We all do, don't we? But he is able to live it out. When you see Jesus do something, you know it is according to God's word. He was perfect. And so he is the embodiment of the word of God. The armies of heaven are following him, riding on white horses. Yeehaw! That's us. I always dreamed of being a cowboy. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a cowboy so bad. You don't even know. I mean, I, I, I mean, I wanted guns. I wanted the hat. I wanted the boots, chaps, boot, everything I could. You know, I had the Lone Ranger in Tonto. I watched the Lone Ranger on TV. I loved westerns when I was a boy. I just wanted to be a cowboy. And then, but we lived in New York. Not in the city. We lived, you know, upstate New York. But still, it's New York. You know, it's, it's not really cowboy country, so to speak. But you know what God did? When I was seven, he moved us to Colorado. Cowboy country. <laughs> I didn't know it at the time. But we lived in Colorado and we ended up living kind of in the suburb or whatever. And, and, you know, I wasn't really happy with that. So I started praying. Started praying that God would give us a horse. Now, keep in mind, our backyard was about as big as this church, maybe a little bit wider. But that, we, we had a small backyard. It wasn't quite big enough for a horse, you know, so to speak. So I was praying that God would move the mean dog Tara that lived behind us, that when our ball went over the fence, it would chase us. And I was praying, God, would you just move them out and would you get rid of our neighbors and so we could have enough room for a horse back there. And I remember, I'd get down on my knees on the couch and I would pray, God, I want a gun, I want a hat, I want a chat, and I want a horse. Would you move that? You know, and I would pray. <laughs> you laugh, but God didn't. God listened to the prayer of a little boy and a few years later, God answered my prayer. He, friends of ours that had lived across the street that brought us to Jesus had moved to a ranch just outside of town. And it was a, just a small ranch, but enough for a horse. They had a barn, they had gardens and all this stuff. And they offered us their house to purchase from them because they had to move to Durango, another part of Colorado. And we were able to afford to do it. And they offered us their horse with their saddle and tack and all that stuff if we would weed the garden that last summer before we moved over there. And so we went over and moved, weeded the garden and all that kind of stuff. And, it was, you know, and, and we got this horse, and I was just uh, I was amazed. I was like, wow, we got a horse. It never dawned on me 
till I was in my mid-20s that God answered that prayer. God answered my prayer, and I had no idea. He listened to a little kid praying, and he answered my prayer. And I never said thank you until I was in my 20s. That's how good your God is. But what's even cooler is he's going to answer my prayer again, and I get a white horse. The first one was named Nuisance, and he would try to knock me off every time I read by a pole. He'd barn pole me, he'd bloat, and the saddle would fall, and all that stuff, and I'd be on the ground, and, and you know, he'd buck. And, and I mean, but I don't think this horse is going to do that. This is a heavenly white horse. So we're going to cowboy up at the end. It's going to be awesome. God's going to allow us the opportunity to ride with Jesus and to make things right. I think that might be why he says, vengeance is mine. We are not allowed as Christians to take our vengeance on this world. As frustrating as that is. Isn't it frustrating sometimes when you just want to knock somebody's teeth out and you just want to deck them one because of what they did? Hold on, it's coming. Jesus is coming. That white horse will be released and we'll be coming with him. And it might be a yee hallelujah or a yee haw hallelujah. I don't know what it'll be, but it, it, it's going to be awesome. His eyes are like blazing fire. Why? Vengeance. He's angry. But understand and know he has given every opportunity possible for a man to repent. Heaven has been revealed. Judgments have been poured out. Warning after warning after warning. They know there is a God. They know there is and they will not repent. So every opportunity to repent has been given. So when Jesus comes and there's fire in his eyes, you know why. It says, coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. This sharp sword, obviously the word of God, is always depicted in Scripture as a sword. A two-edged sword, sharp and powerful, and divides and separates. It's a sharp sword, and it is coming out of his mouth. He is going to be speaking God's word, and it's going to come out of his mouth and destroy the nations. How that's going to look, I don't know. It looks a little weird in my mind, a sword sticking out of his mouth, but... We don't know how that's going to look, but that's, that's what it's declared here. He will rule them with an iron scepter. That iron represents strength. And so he's going to rule them with strength and with power, with authority. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh is the name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus is going to have a tattoo right on his thumb. I don't know if he's going to be in shorts. I doubt it. He's going to have a robe. So it might be written on the robe. So don't, don't take that as, I can get a tattoo. Pastor said, no, I can right. You discuss that with your parents. His robe, written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and on his thigh, this was typical of knights and, and people who rode on horseback because the thigh was obviously exposed on both sides and it was an easy place to advertise, you know, so to speak, and to, to name. And so, so this advertisement is there for, the, for heaven there. But it's declaring he is the king of kings and the lord of lords. It'd be an interesting study, and I'm just pointing this out now because I'm seeing it as reminding me of the promise and the oath taken with the hand under the thigh. Be interesting to study the importance of the thigh and what that represents and if that name is placed there because of the importance of the thigh and that oath and all that kind of stuff. So it might be an interesting study. Uh, you can do that on your own if you like. I might dig into that a little myself, but uh, interesting uh, the, how the thigh is mentioned in Scripture and also with the sacrifice and all that, but it'd be interesting to look into that. But this section is dealing with the Battle of Armageddon. The Battle of Armageddon, of course, we 
studied that in Revelation chapter 16. And so you're seeing this detail being brought up again, kind of overlaid, so to speak, over this. Carrying on in 17, it says, And I saw an angel standing in the sun who, ca- who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper of God. Woohoo! Who wants to be in that supper? <laughs> no, thank you. Uh, if you're invited to that supper, you are the meal or the bird. So if you're not a bird, you're, you are the meal, the main course here. So that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and mighty, and the mighty of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free, and share great and small, or slave, or, I'm sorry, free and slave, great and small. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together, and, and they were to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. This is how I know that God is completely fair and just in his judgment. They are waging war against who? The rider. Who is who? Jesus. They know exactly who they are waging war against. And they think in their strength, in their armies, in their weaponry, they can come against God Almighty. Why? Because their eyes are here. Have they gazed to the heavens and seen what he can do? Have they seen the star? Uh, probably, maybe, they, but are they considering it? No. They're trusting in their weaponry. They think they can actually go to war against this God and win. How foolish. They have an understanding of who they're fighting against. They are not blind to it. They are not ignorant of it. They do not not believe that there's a God. They know and they understand based on all that's happened and all poured out. Remember, they they had all these signs and all these things were showing and coming against them. Why do they not want to? Because their deeds are evil and they have no desire for God. They want to shirk His laws. They want to push off all of God's restraints, all of His laws. The Bible talks about there's a restrainer right now holding back evil. I believe it is the Holy Spirit empowered in the church and it is holding back evil. What is going on right now in this world? Lawlessness, isn't it? When that restrainer is pulled out, when the church is taken up, when the Holy Spirit is pulled out of here with the church because he indwells us, when that Holy Spirit is pulled out, what do you think is going to happen? lawlessness will rule and reign here, won't it? And you see it bucking today, don't you? Like a, like a horse bucks against the saddle. You see it pushing against it and bumping against it. They don't want our laws. They don't want our rules. The nation is raging right now and pulsating against it and pumping against it. Why? For this very reason. Lawlessness, the spirit of lawlessness is, is pervasive pervasive in our world today. It's pushing against it. It's not wanting these Judeo-Christian rules and laws. Our laws are what? Based on the Word of God, aren't they? They are moral. They don't want morality. They don't want this law to hold them back, and they're bucking against it. And so this is something that is supposed to happen. It's supposed to go down. Do we want time? Yes, we do. And so we pray for an outpouring. We pray for a revival. We pray for God to do a work before this all comes about, before his return. We want God to save many. I want him to bankrupt hell and take as many as we can. It's a a powerful time. So these beasts and these kings are coming to wage war against the army. In verse 20, but the beast was captured and with it the false prophet. So these two were captured, who had performed signs on his behalf. <clears throat> these signs, he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. So he deceived them with these, with these miraculous signs. The two of them were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. So they were thrown alive in there, and they are burning as their punishment. What a horrible way to go. 
and a pretty smelly one if you've ever smelled sulfur. The rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on the flesh. Wow. This is going to be a horrific time for those who are on the earth to be killed by the Lord. Powerful. This is not something we will have to endure, go through, or see. We might see it because we'll be with them, but we're not going to actually be uh, a part of this, which is a big relief. But it is a terrible thing. These unbelievers are going to be going to hell. Unbelievers now, just to give you some clarity, unbelievers now who die, they go to the realm of the dead called Hades or Sheol in Hebrew. Believers who die go directly into the presence of the Lord. Paul declared to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so we will be in his presence and we will, we will get to partake of that. Hades, this place that is, it is meant for the unbelievers that die, uh, is a temporary holding place for them. It will be emptied out, and we'll get into that in the next chapter. But it will be emptied out, and then they will be judged, and they will be thrown into the lake of fire. But it's an interesting thing to note because many believers don't know what happens to them when they die. They don't understand but know and understand God's got you. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, and you can be reassured of that. So is there a bad thing in, in, in death? No. Death is something we can look forward to. And I say that in regards to we can leave this body of flesh that is so easily stumbled. And so we can leave this and we'll be free of it and we will be with him. It'll be an awesome thing and that is for eternity. And so it's a great thing to have that happen. As far as judgment, those things that you have done, they're placed under what? The blood of Jesus, you have been imputed with his righteousness. And so it is though you have never sinned. Your sins have been cast as far as the east is from the west. Now your works will be judged, won't they? They will go through the fire, your works. That means the things that you did for God will go through a testing. He will test them to see if it was done well and done right or if there was false intent or false motive with it or something like that. Y'all know we can do good with false intent, don't you? Those things will be judged. Those things that you took credit for and you got the great job, woohoo, that's all you get. <laughs> You're not going to get something in heaven for that. You just got your reward. So we don't want to proclaim those things for the appreciation of men, do we? Those things are going to get burned up in the fire and you just get what you get. So if you want an eternal reward, <laughs> zip the lip and let God get the glory for those things. And so important to know how those things are going to go down. We're going to be getting into the next few chapters and it's going to be exciting. So we're, we're coming to an end of this uh, wonderful book of Revelation. And I hope that it gives you hope, and I, and I hope that it just inspires you to say, you know what, God's got this thing. From beginning to end, he's got it, and he's got me. <laughs> what a better place to be. There is no better place to be than that. So in the midst of COVID, does it matter? If COVID hits you and you die, does it matter? No, it doesn't matter. Be absent from the body, be present with the Lord. So don't walk in fear. Don't allow this thing to stop you from doing what God wants you to do. Be respectful of people who are walking in fear. If you go into a store and there's still the mask thing, and it, wear a mask for their sake, not so much for yours. But wear it for their, for them. And be gracious and be humble. But be praying that God would do exactly what that song declared, what the enemy meant for evil. He will turn it for our good. Amen? Is good. Tony, would you lead us? I would like to, uh, I know it's getting late and we're, we're at the end, but I